Um, and uh, just a little word about uh, the Zarahemla Foundation. This is Zarahemla Foundation is sponsoring this event. And uh, my wife Charlotte told me the other day, she, she thinks people don't know what the Zarahemla Foundation is. So, and I should maybe say something about that. So uh, the Zarahemla Foundation is just a group of uh, saints who are interested in the gospel and in the truth and and are also interested in um, the Hebrew roots of our faith. So we're interested in keeping the feasts, Passover and Hanukkah and the new moons and uh, in fellowshipping with one another. And uh, anyone can be a part of the Zarahemla Foundation. Membership is by voluntary association. There's no need to be baptized or pay dues or anything like that. Um, so all of you here can consider yourself part of the Zarahemla Foundation. Um, we do other activities, uh, people from all, um, all different branches of the restoration are welcome to and encouraged, you know, invited to participate in the events that we do. So, uh, so anything else? Is that good? Okay. So I'll let uh, Josh introduce himself and uh, get started on his presentation. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to have an opening prayer. Uh, I've asked Gary uh, if he would have come up and off of that. And then go ahead. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this opportunity to meet together. And Fellowship and associate and to learn and pray that spirit will be here and grateful for the hospitality of our hosts. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua Hamashiach. Amen. Amen. You're done introducing yourself. Okay. Yep. You can go ahead. I think I'm. It's in the slides. Yep. All right, so hello, everybody. Uh, big thanks to the Ericsons for inviting me out to come and talk at their uh, uh, events by side this evening. Uh, I don't have a lot of public speaking experience, so uh, bear with me. But so we screen sharing and everything, we're all up. Fantastic. So my name is Joshua. Uh, uh, I'll be going on talking about uh, my missionary experience. So I'm a member of Christ Church, and we are one of the only fundamentalist proselyting missionaries. We have one of the only fundamentalist proselyting missionaries. Uh, out of all the different groups, uh, missionary work is a big part of what we believe in. So uh, I'm talking about some of my missionary experience here in Utah and across the states as I uh, went about and served my mission. So I went on my mission when I was about 18. A little bit more about me is uh, I currently work in uh, Tonopah, Nevada. I'm a work as an electronics technician. I'm married with one beautiful baby girl. Her name is Paige. She's pretty fantastic. And then I've uh, grew up in a, a large family, relatively large, uh, four mothers, 26 siblings, as one does have. Um, and yeah. <laughs> and largest, uh, not definitely not the largest family but it's it's i like the size uh so i was born and raised in christ church uh thoroughly converted and uh happy to be there and yeah uh, that's pretty much it about me so a uh, little bit about uh the day of a uh, christ church missionary uh, there's a number of different things we deal with day to day. Obviously, we're relatively uh, close to what a, a LDS missionary might do. But one of the thing, one of the the differences is we are without we go without person script. So that means we don't have a set book of what we read from and what we teach from. We kind of try to go by the spirit and uh, try to talk about whatever we get inspired to talk about, as well as we don't have the funds when we leave on our missions to uh, uh, pay for food and gas and whatever else, the essentials for 
life or need is. So we get all those from donations. So we get, of course, donations from uh, people in the church. So we get donations from the our family or saints in the branch. And I got a quote here. Uh, I didn't ask permission to use him, his quote, but he'd always say, oh, let me see what's in my wallet. Every time I'd come by and you'd see me, let me see what's in my wallet when I was on my mission. He'd pull out whatever cash he had and he'd hand it to us. And that helped us a lot. Uh, big thanks to Joe Wright. Uh, and then... We also get donations from strangers, right? So as we're out teaching people all the time, Erickson's included, they would say, hey, uh, you guys got gas money to get home? And they'd always help us out whenever needed. Uh, another way, because we do travel a lot, uh, it's hard to pay for all that gas. So we often would ask for gas on the go. So at a gas station, we would get out, out of our car and beeline it to whatever stranger we see and say, hey, uh, you, you got a couple extra bucks that we could use for gas and they would react in all kinds of different ways uh sometimes positive a lot of times we're actually very positive that's how we managed to get around right and I, I never had an issue on my mission with money uh, we were we were always provided for sometimes people would be like oh yeah absolutely we, we totally understand <clears throat> and they would fill our tank up or give us five bucks or whatever it might be uh one of the scenarios when i came out i got out of my car and this is a good experience right i uh, we're we kind of split up we kind of try to make it so we could hit everybody there be as most efficient as possible so one of our missionaries would go that way and we go this way and we hit all the vehicles and people at the gas station and ask hey uh you got a minute uh we have a we need some gas and they but this one gentleman i went to talk to we had a relatively nice vehicle he looked like he was well off and i, I said hey I had a pamphlet with me and I said, uh, Hey, how you doing? You got a minute? And he's like, Oh, and yeah, I think he actually said that he actually said, "Uh Oh, when I came up to talk to him and he's like, oh, I'm not really interested. I'm like, okay. Uh, I just, I just wanted to ask if you had a couple extra bucks for me and my missionary companions to make it home. Uh, or at least wherever we were traveling. And he was like, you're asking for gas. I'm like, yeah. So we're, we're missionaries from Christ church. We believe in, uh, Joseph Smith, and we go without person script, so we end up having to ask for gas uh, as we travel. And he went, "Really? Well, you guys got a good thing going on here, huh?" I'm like, "You know, whatever you want to do. Uh, if you don't want to, you don't have the time. You don't have the money. Don't worry about it. You know." Uh, uh, and then he was like, "Okay, well, hand, hand me five bucks, right?" So I went ahead and I put five bucks in, and that was pretty good. A lot of times people just say, "No, thank you," and you know, you move on. But as I was in there, uh, one of the strategies we came up with is we would go and get the receipt for the money we put on the vehicle. So we'd go to start filling it up. My mission commanding was filling up the, the car. I went out and grabbed the receipt. I, after I got the receipt, I went out to him and he was driving off and I waved him down. I said, hey, uh, we got this receipt. Uh, do you want your receipt back for paying for our gas? And he's like, wait, you, act, you guys are actually legit then, huh? I'm like, yeah, yeah. We, totally being honest. So uh, this is what we are. And he's like, okay, fine. And he pulled over and he filled us all the way up. So that was definitely a good experience oh. that we had. Uh, and we, we, we've had a, a number of different experiences. Other times uh, at another gas station close to that one, actually, uh, we went up to this gentleman in to this gas station. And just as normal, I'd go to ask him, I'd have a pamphlet in my hand. I say, Hey, I'm a missionary of Christ church. Here's my credentials, right? You know, this is a uh, pamphlet. If you're interested, we'd love to do service work, service work for you or uh, teach you the gospel if you're interested. And he was like, are, are you asking for gas at my gas station? I'm like, well, we're definitely asking for gas. He's like, yeah, I own this gas station. You can't be here. And he promptly began to chew us out and kick us off the property. So uh, we got uh, definitely a mix, uh, as, as you might imagine, uh, reception as we go and go ahead and uh, make it about. So uh, I mentioned before, one of the main ways we spent our time was service work. So the missionaries here know that, you know, they spend a lot of time doing service work and the whole goal and the idea is about trying to spread the light of Christ in any way we can. So, uh, we do all kinds of jobs, handyman jobs, yard cleanup, uh, roof repairs. We help people move. We help with just about anything, anything that anyone else needs. Uh, if they're willing to let us help. 
And uh, we one time uh, with one of my first companions, uh, um, we went out, we knew somebody that knew somebody that needed help and they had a roof. Uh, their little roof was leaking and they needed help. So we ended up spending like three days straight going and uh, tearing off the, the remainder bad roof that was on there so we could en end up getting it fixed. So we spent a lot of our time doing service work. And uh, we'd also volunteer for events. Right here, you see a, a button. Uh, that's a button uh, one of our members made to actually bring to one of the events to promote the Adam God doctrine. So make Adam God again. Uh, is, we thought that was funny. Uh, the idea actually came from a lady named Christina Rossetti. If I don't mention her, she'd probably be upset because that was her idea, make Adam God again. So, But uh, we also volunteer at these events that we go to and we uh, help uh, set things up and break things down and anything in between. So the whole idea would be as we're going out and we're helping people out, or we're not trying to force, you know, if they're not in interested or don't really, uh, we don't want to force ourselves on them and say, hey, yeah, we, uh, you know, we, we, we just try to be polite about that. And our goal anyways is to bring the spirit with us. So if we're there and we're helping people out and we have the spirit with us, uh, the spirit's going to do more proselyting than we could ever imagine better proselyting that way. And so that's what we spend a lot of our time on, on my mission, at least. Uh, proselyting, one of the forms of proselyting that call untargeted proselyting, untargeted missionary work, things like tracting and stuff. If anyone has served a, a traditional LDS missionary, you know, tracting is uh, what people spend a lot of time on. We spend an uh, average amount of time on it. Uh, we try to... Uh, be wise and productive about our time but every once in a while we'd go out and we'd start knocking on doors and after a bit we'd learn what works what doesn't right since we don't have a set script to go by we would try knock on the door hey we're polygamists and we'd like to teach you about christ church and we'd figure that didn't work out very well uh, they weren't super interested in that right and then we'd knock on another door and we okay well maybe we start with something more soft and then so we did a lot of adaptations and uh, uh, of our proselyting and uh, tracting as we went. Uh, one of the strategies we had is like, well, you want to knock and you want them to hear, but you don't want to be too loud. So we'd knock, I figured out the sweet number seven times, but I'd do it in like a jingle. So it wasn't uh, like aggressive. So I'd like knock like, and then you do like a nice loud knock. That's kind of a jingle and people would normally hear that and come to the door. And uh, so after we kind of adapting how we would answer the doors and figuring things out uh our missionary president uh helped us out get uh what we call the prayer triangle which is kind of a a way to open the door up that's the next slide here so we would go to a door we would have a, our page we would have something looks pretty similar to this on it and we would say hey do you have a minute to learn about prayer <laughs> we'd be holding this page and we'd showing them and they would say, oh, I guess they're talking about prayer because we just told them and, you know, we're, we're showing them on the page. So they'd be like, well, I believe in prayer. And uh, more often than not, we'd actually, people would say, yeah, sure. I'd, uh, I'd be interested in your, your, what you have to say. And we'd say, yeah, it's only going to take a couple minutes. So we started getting more reception when we started doing this. And I actually wanted to go over it with you guys right now. But the prayer triangle is a, uh, it's kind of a demonstration of how prayer works, right? So I pray. Uh, I imagine most everybody here believes in prayer and pr prays as you know, often as they'd like, and they pray to God. And God hears their prayers. And in a perfect world, God would answer their prayers. And he would say, yes, this is, this is the, the answer you're looking for, and he'd let you know. But more often than not, especially on my case, something ends up being in the way that stops the answer from getting all the way back to me. And in order to uh, get my prayer, there'd have to be another way that goes about it to get my prayer answered. So this thing in the way, uh, it could be a number of different things. This could be something special for every indiv individual person. It's likely a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, for me, it might be something like pride or distractions or something. But I'd like to ask you guys, what's your wedge? 
and uh, any uh, audience participation would be appreciated. Um, if you guys have something maybe that, lack of faith sometimes. so maybe a lack of faith, yeah. Adam, not taking enough time to listen, not taking the time to listen. Absolutely. And you already said it's too careful. It's pride, obviously distractions. Pride distractions. Yeah. Honestly, uh, taking honor to yourself as well. Uh, you, you have a question? <laughs> Having your mind on something else, kind of being distracted by something else, not, not listening to God, maybe. And Absolutely. Uh, relying on the arm of flesh. Relying on the arm of flesh. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think everybody has their own kind of wedge, own, own kind of block that blocks the answer from coming back to us. Uh, one of the, the reasons I like it being put in this way is because it kind of shows that the wedge is on your side, right? It's not on God's side. You're the one with the wedge. You're the one that's blocking the answer from getting you. Well, God's wise and sometimes he goes other ways. So maybe if uh, friends, families, or even strangers, if they don't have a wedge, God can maybe say, hey, uh, so Josh over here, he prayed about what to eat for lunch and um, trying to tell him, don't do hot dogs, whatever it is, don't do hot dogs. And I'm going ahead and doing that. Maybe I'll tell them and then they'll come over and they'll, they'll, they'll tell me and say, Hey, uh, this is what you have, should have for lunch. You know, obviously it's a silly example, but, uh, they would be able to answer my prayer. And this could be even not just people, but it could be objects or animals or however God wants to work with you to be able to get you to, uh, hear the answer that you're praying for. But of course, People, other people pray as well, right? Other people, friends, strangers, they also are constantly praying and, and uh, looking for answers for their prayers. And if, uh, if, they're, if they got a wedge on their side, you got to be sure to make sure that you don't have a wedge on your side so you could be there to answer their prayer. So, you know, what comes around, go, comes around, goes around. You could try to everybody help each other out as a group or as neighbors or however uh to get closer to god so that's the prayer triangle we would go and we would talk about that at somebody's doorstep say hey uh if we give you this short presentation and after that people uh, would be a little more receptive right helps talking about prayer before you talk about uh something like plural marriage or something jane um, which um one like so i would i would draw this all on so I would start with just a triangle. And as I'm talking, I would draw on the wedge mm -hmm. and the arrows and all that. So uh, another way of untargeted missioning, kind of broadly doing missionary work is uh, we would, sometimes we set up tables, right? Much like actually this was a picture of a, a table we set up on a college campus right outside an institute building. Uh, there's an LDS Institute and uh, that's something <laughs> generally is disagreed with is uh, Jesus. They don't believe he was married, right? So uh, we thought that was funny. And uh, uh, my mission companion at the time, Matthew, he actually had the idea. And he's like, hey, what if we uh, set up this table and just like it does before, but instead of political, like religious. So we did a couple of different things. Jesus was married with one of them. Uh, Adam was God. Adam is God. Changed my mind. That was one of them. And we try to come up with different things and get creative with it. And at times when we're sitting out with this table, uh, people would walk past and they would come and chat with us, maybe give a pamphlet they're interested. And we'd notice if one started talking, the second one would see, oh, like people, we were allowed to walk up or something. And yeah, we'd start to get more people. And at times we'd have 20 plus people around the table, all talking and asking questions and stuff. So definitely a pretty cool, a little bit nerve wracking to, we got kicked out a couple of times because we didn't ask permission to be there, but, uh, still was a, a good experience for us. We'd also, uh, sometimes if, if we were able to, we'd set up a table at an event or something, this time get permission. And uh, we, 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 we've done street corners, yeah. We did, uh, we sang some songs. So uh, one of our uh, buddies came out to help us do missionary work and he brought his guitar, uh, Simeon. He brought his guitar and he was playing his guitar as we all sang and then we tried to hand out pamphlets to anyone that walked past. And, uh, so we try all kinds of different ways to do missionary work. So that's one of the ones uh, we work on. I think uh, when we did that, I was actually at Temple Square. It was on one of the corners at Temple Squares. 
try to get a good spot. But of course, the, the, the most productive way of missionary work is if we'd actually get an appointment. And uh, we appointments were was the goal when we do tables or we do pro or tracting or whatever it was. If we were able to get an appointment, that was considered a success. As long as we can get an appointment with them and follow up, uh, that ended up being the only way we had ever got long-term success. And that was uh, easily the most productive thing we did. Uh, one of the, the things I tried was I always try and wear a tie and missionary attire, regardless of what we were doing. And we would go out to do missionary work or maybe even do a service project and stuff. And sometimes it's not totally practical to uh, be pulling weeds in your missionary it did, your clothing don't last as long that way but uh we went to that was actually that picture is a picture of a hindu celebration festival of colors down in spanish fork and we went there and uh, got some colors on us but yeah one funny story with the one of the things we ended up doing is uh one of my mission missionary companions we went out and somebody asked us, hey, you guys know how to fix an AC unit, a swamp cooler? We said, yeah, we, we, we deal with those all the time. We have them back at home and stuff. So we went out and we helped her with her AC unit and stuff. And then uh, it was either her or a friend that was doing a yoga class. And they're like, oh, you want to come to our yoga class? Totally free. Don't worry about it. And we were like, sure. So we ended up doing yoga and ties and stuff and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> kind of stood out a little bit. But... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he did most of the time. Yeah. But I can tell you the story after. So, uh, uh, traveling. So we'd travel a lot. Uh, we wouldn't just stay only in Utah. We would go all over. Uh, the first week of my mission, I actually got the chance to go to Ohio. There was an event uh, going on in Ohio uh, that was being thrown on or uh, helped with the community Christ who owns the, the, building we ended up getting a tour inside a private tour inside the kirtland temple which is super awesome and yeah these, these are all my mission companions at the time when we did that travel and ended up stopping in lots of places places on the way so we drove of course and that's like a 80 hour dri drive round trip or something like that uh, so we did a very productive and very fun trip to, to go to So, uh, blue shirt, smiling one, holding, holding the, the phone. Uh, you, good luck seeing him not smiling. It's Derek. He was one of my first companions. Uh, second one over, that was a Treyu. Uh, he, was, he wasn't on the mission for very long when I was on. He got off a couple weeks after. Uh, but it was a lot of fun to spend some time with him. And then Jeremy was my first companion. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember any of these guys. Derek and Atreyu. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's... <laughs> yep. Trina, and then, of course, the last one is me. Uh, and that was, yeah, it's like, first week, I wasn't officially called to be a missionary yet, and we hopped in the car and drove across Ohio, and that was a lot of fun. Down there is a... David Patrick was going to get some good <laughs> pictures over the bridge, so we thought that was funny, and we're taking pictures of him, taking pictures of... Yeah, as they were driving so we uh went all over so like i said we didn't only do missionary work in utah we also of course nevada a little bit of las vegas reno uh, uh california arizona oregon ohio missouri most of the west kansas nebraska illinois washington and more so we just uh some of these were only a couple people we talked to other instances we'd spend a uh, a long time, maybe like in Oregon or something, we'd spend a couple weeks uh, spending time doing some missionary work out there. But a lot of these pictures here are actually of our Ohio trip on the way or something like that. But so on, on our mission, we did end up doing a lot of a lot of things and a lot of things I wasn't really prepared for. Uh, so on the first week, or not not the first week, my first companion. Uh, at the time when I got there, after the first couple months, his father, our prophet at the time, was actually uh, got really ill with a stroke. And uh, we were actually able, got permission from our mission president to go down and spend the last couple of weeks with him as he was passing away. 
and that was Gerald Peterson Jr. Uh, as he was passing away, and uh, that was something that I wasn't really ready for as we went out. We spent a lot of time with our family and uh, never seen anyone, you know, kind of de decline like that. And I was, uh, honestly, was a testimony builder, and it was really cool to see, you know, him put up a fight, you know, and with all of his family and stuff. So that picture is the left of his grave there in Pink Lane. Uh, another brother uh, of the name Kevin Gordon, he also passed away on my mission that uh, we spent a lot of time going to his, his house and he housed the missionaries before we got there. Uh, but unfortunately he had cancer and he was going downhill from there. And uh, one of the things we did is we spent a lot of time uh, going to him as because he couldn't get out of bed after a while and he wanted to take the sacrament and we gave, went to go give him blessings and stuff. And we were trying to be there to support his family. And uh, one of the times we, we were able to get some funds from some other people and brought pizza for the, his whole family that was there. And we were with him a couple, couple hours before he actually passed away. But uh, one of the other things that went on is there was kind of a complication. So he had passed away, uh, which is always hard for everybody. But uh, one of the complications was he wanted to be buried next to his daughter who passed away at a very, very young age. Uh, she was uh, laid to rest at uh, our own cemetery over in Paquin. If people know where that's at, it's west of Cedar City. And uh, she was buried at that time. He wanted to be buried with her, but the rest of the family, which aren't associated with Christ right. Church, uh, yeah. very, very nice people, but they wanted to bury him in their hometown. Yeah. So there was a problem, right? He wanted to be buried next to her, but they wanted him to be close enough that they could visit him. So uh, our mission president had a great idea. He gave us a call and said, hey, uh, yeah, can you guys dig a hole? And at the time, Matthew, he's the one in the picture, uh, and him says, yeah, what do we need to do? So we ended up spending a day going down and uh, digging up a grave. We got a permit to move the body and everything and uh, pulling it out and be able to fill his wish right, of being buried with her, so that was one of the things that really, like, never would have expected to be doing some of this stuff. We moved her, daughter. Like, we moved her yeah, so uh, uh, another thing, uh, so, some of this uh, is uh, definitely some uh, uh, sensitive information, I guess, so uh, there's a gentleman in Oregon who had a hard time, uh, had, a, had maybe not the most uh, healthy relationship with his girlfriend at the time uh, we had met him through another contact or actually a member and we were talking to him and uh we introduced him to the book of mormon and joseph smith and uh he was he was okay at that point and then a couple days later i guess he had seen the number on the pamphlet we gave him and at the time he just called me up and called the missionary number and said hey i'm having a really hard time I just kind of want to commit suicide right now. And he had, uh, I can't remember exactly what the, the method was, but I, uh, you know, one of the things I had to do is I talked him down from, from uh, doing that, and, you know, so definitely wasn't prepared for any of that kind of stuff, but definitely don't regret it. I appreciate the, the chance to, to experience uh, new things, but moving on from some of my own missionary experiences in general, that was kind of a, a list of what a lot of uh, the missionary work looks like, at least in Christchurch. Uh, I wanted to go over a number of quotes. So bear with me. I uh, compiled a couple of quotes from Joseph Smith uh, in a couple of slides here. So the standard of truth has been erected. No one hollowed hand can stop the work from progressing. Persecutions may rage. Mobs may combine. Armies may assemble. Colony may def defame. But the truth of God will go forth boldly nobly and independence till it has penetrated every continent, visited every clime, swept every country and sounded in every ear. till the purpose of God shall be accomplished. And the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. And this is in Joseph Smith history. So uh, of course, Joseph Smith uh, taught, lived and preached missionary work uh, all the time. Uh, a couple more quotes about missionary work. A man filled with love of, of God is not content 
with blessings, with blessing his family alone, for ranges through the whole world, anxious to bless the whole human race. And then the next one, after all that has been said, the greatest and most important duty is to preach the gospel. And I'll get through the next couple here and then. So do not be discouraged on the account of the greatness of the work. Only be humble and faithful. He who scattered Israel has promised to gather them. Therefore, inasmuch as you are to be instrumental in his great work, he will endow you with power, wisdom, might, and intelligence, and every qualification necessary. And that's also in the history of the church. And then here, I'll read the first two. Third one, we were, uh, it's actually on one of the other slides that I've already read. Uh, persecutions has not stopped the progress of truth, but has only added fuel to the flame. It has spread with increasing rap rapidity. Proud of the cause which they have espoused and conscious of the innocence and of the truth of their system amidst calumny and reproach have the elders of this church gone forth and planted the gospel in almost every state in the union that has penetrated our cities it has spread over our villages and has caused thousands of our intelligent noble and patriotic citizens to obey its divine mandates and be governed by its sacred truths it has also spread into england Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. When in the year of 1840, a few of our missionaries were sent and, and over 5,000 joined the standard of truth. There are numbers now joining in every land. And then one more. Uh, so this is a DNC4 on my mission. Uh, this was one chapter that our mission president wanted us to memorize. So uh, I would read it by memory, but... I, I didn't totally memorize it, but uh, uh, this is probably my favorite scripture on, on missionary work. So now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. Therefore, O ye that embark in his service, see that you serve him with all your heart, mind, and strength, that you may stand blameless before God in the last day. Therefore, if you have a desire to serve, you are called to the work. For behold, a field is white and are ready to harvest. And lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth in store, that he perisheth not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. And faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye signal to the glory of God qualify him for the work. Remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. Ask and you shall receive, not and it should be open unto you. But, I mean, of course, in Christ Church, we believe in... Uh, uh, living all the laws and ones of the gospel and missionary work is one of the main ones we believe in. And that just hits all the points right there, right? Knock and you shall be open or uh, knock and, and it should be open unto you. Fields is white. It just uh, definitely my favorite scripture on missionary work. And then I went ahead and of course I had to uh, get some quotes from Jesus Christ. So this is just from the New Testament, uh, the four standard works. Uh, so in... <clears throat> Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And then uh, Matthew 28, 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teach them to obey every everything i've commanded you and surely i am with you always to the very end of the age and then uh, a couple in mark and he called unto him the 12 and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey save a staff only no scripts no bread no money in their purse and that's a little, little more of extreme, no person script than what we even go by. I definitely had a coat when I was going about uh, teaching mission work. But in uh, Mark 10, 45, uh, for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. And 16, uh, verse 15, and he said unto them, go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, and is baptized shall be saved, 
but he that believeth not shall be damned. And then the last uh, few, I have a, a couple in Luke and John. And therefore said unto, or Luke 10 too, therefore said unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into, the har into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Ne carry neither purse, nor script, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And then I'll read the one in John real quick. So uh, John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. And ye shall go and bring forth fruits. And that your fruits shall remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of your father in my name, he shall give it to you. He, he may give it to you. So uh, in Luke, uh, this is uh, one of the last verses in all of Luke. Uh, it's one of the charges he gave to the apostles to go out and do missionary work, uh, just to kind of stress uh, missionary work and its importance. Uh, to Luke 24, 47. And he, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And uh, I just, uh, you know, I couldn't go through a, a talk without talking about, you know, some, a couple of quotes. Uh, and special thanks to David Patrick helping me uh, get a bunch of those. But uh, of course, uh, the G Joseph Smith and Jesus Christ, they taught missionary work. And uh, why wouldn't, if you believe you're uh, living all the laws and orders of the gospel and things like consecration or, or plural slash or marriage, of course, like missionary work, why would you miss that too, right? So in Christ Church, we believe in, uh, we have a threefold mission that we uh, focus on, that kind of tis about most everything. Uh, number one of that is redeeming the dead. So we believe in temple work. Uh, we have two temples currently at the time. Uh, one of them is not, uh, we are not currently doing uh, temple work in that building. That's the one on the screen. Uh, I was having a hard time finding a picture of that temple. Uh, I swear I had a couple of them, but I ended up getting that one off of uh, uh, Wikipedia and uh, it's a little bit blurry. So, but yeah, we believe very heavenly in uh, redeeming the dead. We believe in temple work. Uh, we actually have a temple session this weekend that I'm excited to go to and uh, participate in. And yeah, we, we also just uh, hit on in Christ church. Uh, we went ahead and we believe in revelation, of course, but we also believe in uh, what the other uh, previous prophets revealed too. So what we have is not changed from uh, as least as what we could find and uh, was revealed to us from the original endowments given from Joseph Smith, but uh, more like Brigham Young and uh, Wilfred Woodruff in them. So <clears throat> mission two is affect the saints, right? Uh, I was actually running out of time on some of these slides and I actually stole this one straight from our uh, website. Uh, but you, know, you can't argue with the point. So we believe in uh, perfection through repentance through Jesus Christ. And Nephi talks about I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall repair away for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he commanded them. God has given us a commandment to be perfect. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven, which is perfect. Uh, it's a lot easier to say than do, right? Being perfect. Uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, everybody in, who's lived the gospel has worked on it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, at least trying to better themselves. Uh, but we believe in doing that as a group. We believe in the gathering. We believe in uh, uh, building Zion. So uh, one, of the, one of the ways we do that is uh, I wanted to mention a quick story of even this last weekend, right? We do what we call our wooding projects. We go out and we collect wood for our group. Those that have wood burning stoves, those that aren't able to get it themselves. We used to, everybody would get it separately, figured out that wasn't the most productive. And eventually we figure out better and ba better and better ways to do it. Obviously a lot of people can't get their own wood, right? Some people can't go out and pick up a hundred pound log and 
put it in their minivan and drive it back, you know, from the mountains, right? So we go out with uh, bigger equipment and uh, gather up and we've kind of adapted a better system. Uh, at first we started where we would just park all of our trucks and trailers where we get the wood. So we have a spot that had a big burn a couple of years ago and a lot of the wood is still good. Uh, they're all dead, but so it just has to be collected. So we just park our vehicles and then everybody would spread out and try to pick up all these huge logs and bring it to our trucks to then drive it down the mountain to uh, where we are at. Figured that's not very productive and said, well, what if we took like a four wheeler and went and collected the wood with like a four wheeler. So we grabbed a trailer, threw it in the back of like a four wheeler that can go over. And eventually after a couple of years, we figured, uh, why don't we just take the trucks to the wood? So now this last year, we just make a road and we take the trucks and we go up and we just bring the, the wood to, to the road and pile on the trucks. And we ended up getting something like 80 cord of wood uh, this last weekend, which is uh, pretty, pretty fantastic. It's a lot of fun, for sure. And then uh, the last of a threefold uh, mission that we have in Christchurch is missionary work, of course. Uh, uh, these here are some of our pamphlets. Uh, if you're, if we, they talk about uh, very broad. These are the tracks that we give out when we're going tracking and proselyting. And yeah, if you're interested, we, we'd love to give them out in as many as you'd want. But yeah, that's uh, it for uh, the threefold mission of Christchurch. And uh, that's just about all. Hopefully, I, I'm not too short on time. Uh, but yeah, thanks for letting me come over and come out. And like I said, I'm not too familiar with public speaking, but I appreciate the chances to get up there, start learning and practicing as I go. Uh, yeah, thank you. And here are some of uh, my contact information. And uh, if you want to get hold of the missionaries, uh, there's their contact information. Including for service. Including for service. You want them to come over and do labor. Yes, they're very happy to do as much labor. Yeah, absolutely. I, I forgot to put a slide in for that. Uh, if anyone has any questions about anything. Yes. I can say there are two temples. Yes. And you showed a picture of one of them. That one's not currently. It's not currently in operation. That one is based out in uh, on the western border of Utah, kind of past Cedar City. Uh, and that was the first one we built. So as we were organized in 1978, Immediately, we started work on that temple right there. And uh, right now, we don't have a lot of saints out in that area. So we've kind of moved out. Our second table is out, or second temple, rather, is out at Nevada, where we currently meet and group together and actively do uh, ordinance work in that one. It, it's definitely different. Uh, that one was organized and got revelation through the prophet at the time. Uh, to build, be built in a pyramid shape. Uh, I, I wasn't there to build it as before my time, but uh, the one we have now, we kind of built it like, uh, we were told that it should be more like a uh, resemblance of ourselves. So on the outside, all the saints look like an ordinary, a generic person you might meet, nothing special about us. But on the inside, we're supposed to be better, right? So we're supposed to, uh, you know, grow better and perfect ourselves. So in, in the inside of that temple, we tried to make it look as nice as possible. On the outside, it looks uh, like a generic normal building, but yep. Is that temple used for ordinances or exclusively, or is it also used for So uh, the way we have it, I think uh, the answer to that would be, it's used for all of it, but we have uh, designated portions of the temple. So, Connected to the temple, we do have our meeting rooms. We do have our classrooms where we do Sunday schools or uh, primary school for the kids and all that kind of stuff. We also have a kitchen in that same building. It's all kind of connected, but we do have rooms set apart for ordinance work and baptisms and uh, the like. Any other questions? Yes. Do you have plans for the we have plans for a third. I think there's always plans for a third. You know, we'd like to. Uh, the possibility of a third. We have plans. <laughs> uh, we do not currently have plans for a third.
we're trying to max capacity on our first one first. So, you know, we might actually, I don't know that I'd be privy to that information exactly. I don't work directly with uh, that kind of stuff. Although I, I did get the chance to work on our, our, the one we currently are, it was operational, which was, uh, we, if I didn't mention, we do uh, work parties as a way of uh, giving our Saturdays to the Lord, right? So Saturdays is also a holy day. And the way we uh, do that is we try to donate our Saturdays to the Lord and we go and uh, we get together the whole, as, you know, everybody that's able to come and we work on the Lord's temple or maybe uh, some saints in need or something like that. If they have some houses that need some help or whatever it might be. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So roughly about two, we don't have a lot of missionaries. So we have two active missionaries at the time. And uh, one of them has been on the mission for about three years now, almost. The Jordan here, been on the mission for about three years. And uh, I, I, uh, yeah, uh, we've had as much as four or five on the mission at a time. But uh, right now it seems like two. Jordan? I was going to ask this. Uh, but, but, sorry, we also don't, it's not just full time missionaries, there's also people who right. do part time missionary work as well. Right. So, I'm not sure people can hear from there, but yeah. Yeah, so what, what Jordan just said was uh, on top of our full time missionaries, which right now, where our two full time missionaries are full time missionaries, they spend every day at the effort of trying to do missionary work and do service work and stuff. But we also have uh, part time missionaries uh, that come out. Uh, since myself, I've gone out and helped do missionary work. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, members of our church, we believe that everyone's always called to a mission, especially you have a priest of calling. It mentions in the, the scriptures if you have a priest of calling. And it's not only uh, only for the men. Our, our women go out and do missionary work as well. But yeah, we've figured you're always called to a mission. You're just, uh, sometimes you're working on some other things at the same time. Uh, Jordan? There's also not um, age length. You can go out whenever you wish. If you feel right. it's just like at the DNC, it says if you have a call, call to the work, then you're called. Yeah, if you're called to work. Fired, yep. Uh, we do try and have uh, them be at least 18, right? Generally. I think I, I went out and was doing part time mission work when I was 16, too. But you try to make sure everybody finishes, finishes high school before you go out and do missionary work and that kind of thing, too. Or at least full time missionary. Uh, Trina, you had your hand oh, up? Oh, I was just going to say our women. Missionaries, yes, absolutely. It's yep. not like they are on a full time mission, but they should go when it's the major. Yeah, and Joshua, so, uh, would you send women on a full time mission, or is that uh, happen probably? But is that not for like Christ? We haven't happened yet. Uh, that would be probably a, a, a question for our mission president, uh, but. As far as I know, right now, uh, no, 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 no full-time missionaries, or at least plans in the work. How many years ago did Christ Church start? So I, I believe the first time it started. Uh, so the group started back in 1978. Uh, that's when we believe that the church and the priesthood uh, came into one place, and that was organized by Gerald Peterson Sr. And I think as he was organizing together everything. Uh, we started doing missionary work then full-time missionaries probably started a couple years after that so uh, i think i was here in like 1980 or something like that so so a couple years after we group do we actually start getting full-time missionaries out the door uh, do you have concentrations where the members uh, gather like you mentioned Tonopa, right I believe there's another place further down County, is that right so uh we do we do have meetings in spanish fork okay. uh, uh that's just where currently the, the missionaries are staying at a house at uh down in that area and we have a, a member or two out there as well so but there's a concentration uh, so we yeah gathering at one place yeah so we believe in gathering so we everybody's in general uh we move out to tonopa that's where our gathering place is at uh, but we do have a couple of different areas. Uh, one of them 
uh, is down in St. George area, uh, close to St. George. And then on, in, it's Cedar. in Cedar? Yeah, Cedar and it's kind of four. Right, okay. So Tonopah, Spanish Fork and Cedar is what the missionary is telling me, which you would know a lot better than I have, so. Right. So yeah. Yes. Some branches of restoration some groups that have had media attention have a lot of like positive and negative yes. Right. A lot of negative media attention. Christ Church had media attention and so was it positive or negative? Not a lot of media attention. Uh, I know one of the things that I hear about if people have heard of us, at least in the media, was uh, a long time ago, back when we first started, for a portion, Tom Green was part of our group for a portion of the time. Uh, that didn't last long. Uh, but as far as I know, not a lot of media attention. We do have a website, and we have been in podcasts. We have sent members of uh, gone on to some popular Mormon podcasts and stuff as well to uh, do interviews and stuff. And... I think there's a book as well that we ended up uh, adding in there. Trina? Um, you'll find us on Facebook. Yeah, and or Facebook. Not Facebook or... But like if you just go in and look up Christchurch, the brand, or Joe, W. Peterson Senior, you'll see that. And you'll see the picture of the, the pyramid. Right. So, yeah, on a Wikipedia page, we have you'll that. You'll see some things like that. Right. No, we have a podcast, some podcasts that are in Right. Hey, Joshua? Oh, yeah. So there's just a comment on the chat. I'm just going to read to everyone. Okay. Uh, That's from David Patrick. Uh, he says, we have sisters that are going out together for events. These sisters are married and many have children, so they won't be full time. But for mission events and specific people that they want to go visit. We also have wives and husbands that go on missions together. Uh, I don't know if people heard that. I, I can pull up the chat right here. I can go ahead and read it again uh, if we oh, want yeah. to. Yeah, so uh, we have sisters that are, uh, with, this is what Joshua was just saying. We have sisters that are going out together for events. These sisters are married and, and many have children, so they won't be full-time. But for mission events and specific people uh, that they want to go visit, we also have wives and husbands that go out on missions together as well. I believe I had another hand up here. I'm uh, just wondering, uh, in reference to these, other groups had the controversies. Has that led to a lot of people leaving those groups and showing interest in yours? Uh, um, I, I don't know uh, exactly the answer to that. Uh, the question was, is not as much as like. yeah, not as much as we like, right? So it, the question was, is with uh, these different controversial things going on with some of the other groups, uh, are we having a bigger influx of people joining Christchurch because of that? Uh, Joshua answered it for me, not as much as we like, I guess. But a couple of them, I guess. But. So, yeah, we got one from Enoch Gorson. So he said, full-time missionaries for younger generation, 19 to 20 years old, was started in 19, 1992. First missionaries was in the Provo, Utah area, uh, 1992. Other full-time missionaries were started much earlier among apostles in 70s. Okay. Correct. Yeah, because Enoch was one of the first right. missionaries. Right. Right. So full-time missionaries uh, took a little bit longer to catch on. We were sending out missionaries because we believe apostles are to uh, do missionary work, of course. So a lot of our apostles are out doing missionary work whenever they can. So when Christ Church was first started, there was a lot of the apostles that were going out doing a lot of the missionary work. Right. Josh. She did. I, I I probably could have just uh, asked, and she would have provided. I'm sure, but I I I think I was doing it late at night. Right. Uh, I don't know that I could pull it up right now, but if anyone else wants to see any pictures of our temples or whatever, I'm getting uh, I'm getting hooked up. So, uh, any more questions? Yes. So he's so the question was is does Christ Church have good relations to other branches or other groups of fundamentalism? Uh, in general, we don't have bad relations. I don't know that we have a lot of relations at all, but 
a lot of different groups are kind of close knit and tight and uh, aren't really welcome. I know as a missionary, I spent a lot of time going and maybe knocking on doors and some other groups and they weren't too fond of that. Some of them, but I, I don't know that we have a whole lot of relations in general with other groups. Uh, okay. So I'm part of a Facebook group called Women of the Restoration. And just for an example, um, the people that started out was Elizabeth Green and she was part of the Church of the Firstborn. Those are their red colors. And then um, she has a friend that's in the LDS church, Christine Blythe and Chris, which they're work up in the BYU. And, and then my sister from another mother, Dalita Peterson, which is his mom. So those three got together and decided to form this group called Women of the Restoration. Well, of course, then I got involved. And We've had a lot of different women that have been a part of this group that are from many different fundamentalist groups. And that's how I met Melissa Erickson. Uh, actually, I met her because I went to the fence for her because we had someone that got into that world that was trying to be very antagonistic. And we've set up this group where everybody can voice their viewpoints, their religious viewpoints without fear of any kind of criticism or judgment you'll have a safe place to talk and share. And so the funny thing, well, it wasn't really funny, but this lady was just really bashing her and another couple of people on there and telling them they were going to go because of plural marriage. And so I got on there and I tried to get this lady to get off and talk to me personally on Messenger so that it wouldn't be causing all these bad feelings. Um, I ended up having to ask she just cut her off because she was not even willing to try to be respectful in any way. And but then I reached out to Melissa and I reached out to some of the other ladies and I said, I'm really extremely sorry for this. This is not how I'm a part of Christ Church. These other ladies are parts of these other religions, but this is not how we treat other people of different beliefs. And she's like, Oh yeah, I know you. I mean, I know about you in Christ Church because your missionaries are sitting in my living room right now. And she tells me that. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> what a small world. <laughs> so um, I have quite a few relationships with a lot of people from a lot of different groups. And we have really good friendships. So um, I'm just speaking for myself. Right. But, um, I can go just about into any group and I can get along with people because, and I think I can speak for Christ Church. We try to focus on what we have in common. We share what differences we have, but we are not in here to debate because that's the spirit of Lucifer. There's a spirit of Lucifer. Right. We all are brothers and sisters in the gospel and the war in heaven was fought for free agency, and we need to respect each other. So it sounds like some of the women in different groups have some good friendships, and maybe the men have some catch up with the Yeah, maybe. So uh, just to try and recap some of that, uh, Trina was talking about how she does have communications in lots of different groups. So it might be a more of an individual basis. Uh, I don't, but I mean, I don't know that I could, uh, I don't have a lot of experience in exactly what relations we have between the groups so probably not the best person to answer that but thank you Trina. You're welcome. do we have any other questions at all yeah, yes so when you do baptisms i guess once you baptisms huh? are you baptizing people into the gospel so uh what charlotte asked was uh, when we do baptisms, do we baptize them into the church or is it uh, into the gospel and is the church like optional? Uh, uh, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question. Uh, I do know we have a couple different parts. Of course, we believe in baptism and uh, we believe, of course, you, you have to have the authority to baptize. And then we believe in the gift of the Holy Ghost as well. And then a separate part as well as we also believe in uh, 
uh, and maybe, maybe somebody on the chat can help me out and answer that question better than I can. Right. But then we also have a uh, confirmation. That's what it's called. Confirmation as well, which is another step of the process. Yeah, like like if I feel because we are we believe that we're continually progressing in the gospel, and as you progress in the gospel, you start seeing more of the things in your life that you want correction of, and you want to renew your covenants with you know, Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. So a baptism is like a renewal and saying, okay, now I recognize that there are more things in my life that I need to change and that I want to repent of and I want to be able to have a clean slate again and move forward. Is that kind of an individualized thing to talk about? It's totally or, individualized. Like, so some people may request it more often than others. I yeah, mean, I mean, you could go, you could, you could get rebaptized every month if you wanted, or you could wait, like you said, 10 years. It's, it's an individual thing. So that's a good point, uh, Trina, to bring up rebaptism in Christ Church. We do believe in rebaptism, and that's uh, uh, can be part of a repentance process, but that's something that uh, I think was originally started from uh, Brigham Young back in the day. But oh, and some people do it for healing, right? They want to baptism for healing. So I know we got some comments in the chat, I got some hands raised. so. Oh, uh, so it's not from bringing up Joseph Smith. Joseph, Joseph Smith. Smith. Yeah. Okay, rebaptisms started with Joseph Smith. Thank yeah, you, Jordan. No, I, I'm pretty, I can't and remember then, quotes, I right. Yeah. Uh, Joshua I clarifies rebaptisms were even older than Joseph Smith. So, Amen. thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, I, so, that, so Anne, the, yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, is the, the, so the wording of uh, baptizing into oh refresher? Because the, the the baptism of prayer that you use is it to just the one that's in the doctrine of covenants or the general one? Okay. So there's there's nothing about the church actually in the church. Right. Okay. I want I want to clarify. Uh, that. So I'll I'll read and uh, commented before I think. So I think this was uh, related to our relations with other groups. Uh, several of the converts to Christ Church came from the LDS, SLC Church, and the AUB. So a lot of our members are from other groups. Individual, originally at least. Uh, individual members are friends with other fundamentalist groups and churches and independent fundamentalists. Uh, overall, we are building relationships as a church and ac others across all churches and people of the restoration. And then uh, Anne also answered for me. Thank you, Anne. Uh, for the, she said, the wording is to baptize and confirm into Christ's church for those who are passed beyond the veil and live baptisms. And then. Wording for re uh, baptism Yes, the wording for the rebaptism is the same as initial baptism. Uh, uh, yes. Just to add on to what Anna is saying, so for instance, my grandfather Joe he was part of the other group. They were called the A D at that point. That's after the women's but so we were members of that group and so a lot of us came from that group and then we before that we were actually my parents were actually members of the LDS church and my grandfather was a member of the church. So it was one step at a time for them continuing. If you want to know more, we can talk to them. Right. Uh, and yeah, that's a, another point about uh, our group associated with some other groups. Our, our priesthood genealogy does track down uh, through the Lord, the Lauren line, the Woolly line, I'm sorry, the Woolly line. Uh, Lauren Woolly was. Uh, after Lauren Woolley, we do believe in J. Lesson Broadbent, I believe, uh, and then Joseph Musser, 
and then Roland Allred, and then we believe the keys passed on from Roland Allred, and then to Joseph uh, Gerald Peterson Sr. So that uh, does come through the, the AUB priestly lineage as well. And we have a number of comments here. Uh, let's see. I'll just go ahead and read the most recent one. Uh, Anne clarifies, I think, the wording for rebaptism is for the most is for the most part the same as the baptism, but if it is for healing, there is a slight different difference, like a, a baptism combined with a short bless or blessing of healing. So we got some good scriptures posted in the chat too. Uh, DNC twenty two. So yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, we had another comment uh, asking or talking about uh, those baptized into the LDS Church. So we, we do not recognize the LDS Church baptisms, of course. Uh, we believe uh, so. When people would join from the LDS Church, we would then have them baptized or or rebaptized, I guess, uh, into Christ Church and all the steps, confirmation and Holy Ghost. Not only the LDS. What's that? Any. 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 Right. Any. So do, you uh, do we redo ceilings? Uh, yes, uh, we do all the ordinances. Uh, we have had instances where uh, when we go to get revelation to do something like that, they said, oh, it's, that one's already been done. So, uh, but that, that's on specific cases and some stories that I'm not super familiar with. But in general, we, we tried the, through everything, we try to go through revelation, right? And, uh, you know, if God's directing me, then you know you're right. Trina? So when Christ Church was first started, um, my grandfather started it in Provo at the Ninth Kingdom Mountain. You can look that up on the historical thing and you can actually go over that. So there's a carriage house that's behind that. In the back of the carriage house is the first baptismal font we had. We had our first conferences and meetings in that carriage house. So it's little bit of history and endowments were given in the top part until we were actually able to make yeah. the other couple. So, so baptism for the dead was in your font. Figured if we have a font, we'd, we'd use it. So yeah, we use it for uh, all baptisms. Uh, we can use other places for baptism as well. Uh, we just dedicate the water for that purpose. I mean, I'm sorry, we, we use other bodies of water, right? So I know people that were baptized in tubs. Uh, and so as long as it's horse troughs, there's another common one, lakes. Uh, so, you know, people had to break ice sometimes, you know, just like back in the old days. Uh, maybe not. But we do not, we, we do not do baptizing by sprinkling. We do believe in baptizing by full immersion. Do we have any more? questions i think i think we're we're mostly caught up i know there's a lot of comments if, if you had a comment in there i missed it i'm sorry about that uh so my question is when someone is like investigating the church what or actually let's back up when you're doing interior work what exactly are you thinking because some people think like if somebody ever believes something they dismiss then what is the new thing that you feel like you're bringing the table the conversation and also related is when someone is interested in doing it, what is it that they're like? Right. Uh, what do you have like requirements for the people you said? Because their savior like what is the list that you're saying like what are the requirements, yeah. right? To uh, to get baptized. Did you have a, a related question or answer? Well, kind of uh, of, a, of an answer, I guess, a little bit. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. I, I joined Christ Church about eight years ago. Right. Um, now, I I was probably a little bit different from what Jordan had said. He was, he was kind of my contact there, but I was pretty well versed in fundamentalism by the time I came. So things like Joseph Smith weren't an issue. What was an issue was me getting, I mean, just rapid fire. I put that poor kid through the printer. Sometimes I still like him. I'm like, yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it wasn't that bad because I, I just kind of let him and Sean have it all at once. I was like, well, how about this? 
How about that? How about that? And, and I'd actually investigated Christchurch and kind of got some information from from some other people and kind of peppered them with that. And this is some of the criticism, how you respond to that. And he was very good about saying, you know what, I'm not 100% sure. Let me go back and do that. So it, in my case, I don't know if it's typical. Jordan can probably speak to that better than I can. Um, but uh, I, I think it, it I don't think most folks just one day wake up with inclination if you're in the LDS church. You know, I should just go investigate the other branch of Mormon, right? I mean, those, those aren't something that they do. So normally I don't like that. Yeah, nor, yeah exactly. So, but yeah, that was, that was what, what, what I saw. And, and I'll be honest, one of the things that, that I did like is that um, they were very good about telling me what they were for and not what they were against. Um, uh, that, that was huge. Um, some of the other places I investigated, it was always kind of from the negative end. I'm not saying that that's typical, that's just what I experienced. Because for me, as a convert to the LDS church, it didn't take me long to start thinking, okay, maybe there is other places, of, other, you know, branches of Mormonism where I might fit in better. So, you know, it surprises me that most converts don't think that way. Right. Did, did that kind of answer your question? I, yeah. I appreciate you sharing the story, but I didn't actually. Okay. Know. Right. So, but no, don't apologize because I like hearing the story. Well, I kind of have an episode. Okay. Yeah, I, I could go for I could try and give it a shot. <laughs> uh, but so just to recap the question, you said what are the requirements to what, 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 what are the. Like, what does Christ church? What unique doctrine is Christ Church in your conversation? And what exactly are the like, Right. So if you're checking off Jesus Christ already, right? Yeah, I, I, it depends on the individual. Uh, if you. Like, like you probably have a that has like. Yes. In the LDS, if, you, if there's an LDS convert. Like you, you know, you ask them if they believe in Jesus, in, in Joseph, and the right. Book of Mormon, and all of that's common. Right. But they also say, do you believe that okay. Thomas S. Monson is the one with the authority, you know? And that's kind of a unique thing that you, that you have to believe in order to right. be baptized in the LBC. Russell and Nelson now. Right, so, right. So, so I mean, that's just, what, what are the unique things that is a requirement for converts to believe in order to be able okay. To so I could probably actually get you the baptismal questions, okay. which would answer. I, I off the top of my head, last time I was baptized was a while ago. Uh, but off the top of my head, uh, I, I can't think of all the questions. Well, I was but this before you kind of started, like, do you right. Require, that is a question yes that's one of the questions on it. uh i think it's in both uh right this is the the current key holder right and that you guys are the Right. Uh, we believe uh, one of the things about priesthood we believe that uh, one way it was explained to me was if you have a telephone, uh, like a not a mobile phone, but telephone with the rack and everything, and it's plugged into the wall, you have the telephone, right? And if you use it, you're connected to the system, right? If you cut yourself off, uh, then you're no longer connected to the whole tree. So we do believe in. Uh, file leadership and we believe in an order and things so we believe that there is a president of the melchizedek priesthood and a president of the Aaronic priesthood and we work through those chains so uh uh file leadership is a good uh something that we believe in that i don't think other churches believe in as far as i know is uh, we believe that each individual it should have a file leader that way they can be connected up uh through the line of uh, to God. So my file leader would be my father, and then his file leader would have a file leader would have a file leader up to uh, the prophet who 
we actually believe it keeps going on that side. So when he would then look to get answers, he would go to his file leader and his, and then so on all the way up the chain to Jesus Christ. Right. So, uh, we believe in, uh, an order in the priesthood. So, uh, in general, that would say, yes, that means if, uh, the AUB is, uh, doing ordinances and stuff, we wouldn't recognize those ordinances or whatever, uh, priesthoods they have or, but does that get a little bit of a question? Like I said, I could get you also the baptismal questions. Exactly. And, uh, I think so. Uh, hopefully I'm not saying I should, I shouldn't. What's that? Am I getting grilled on the chat? I think there's by you. I, I, absolutely not. I appreciate the questions. Uh, if I can't answer something, sorry. Like, but we do have a number of comments that a couple of them, I think. So uh, Enoch mentions baptism and ordinance given upon a person's demonstrating faith in Jesus Christ and repentance and willingness to live the commandments of of christ church it doesn't necessarily mean you have a sure testimony of the church but that you are showing a broken heart and a conscious spirit and willing to give up old ways and become a new member in christ it also doesn't mean uh you will be perfect but perfectly learning is the goal to become perfect and live in his commandments and then uh, we had, uh, I guess we had a new member. So I got baptized a year ago. And what I remember were a couple of worthiness questions and questions. If I was willing to obey the word of wisdom as understood by the branch, uh, branch church also about the file leadership, uh, there are probably a few more, maybe tithing a couple other things on the list too, but they're just people, uh, remembering some of the questions, uh, that they were given. Gotcha. Gotcha. But uh, uh, any more questions? And uh, I guess we'll wrap it up. Yeah.